my name is Christine Trost. I'm filling in for Martine today, who is on his way to Israel for a couple weeks, so he sends his regrets. Sorry he's not here, especially since he was really excited to, to hear Emily's talk. Emily is his neighbor, and he's been talking about her for a very long time, so we're really excited that you're here. Um, I'm going to uh, say a few things about um, the format and our speakers, and then we'll get going. But before I do, I want to announce our next event, which may be of interest to some of you. On March 15th, which is a Thursday at 4 p.m. here in the Woldowski Room, ISSI's Center for Right-Wing Studies will sponsor a talk by Professor George Hawley, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Alabama, and his talk will be on the question, is the alt-right collapsing? So I encourage you to come. Please turn off your cell phones. Um, the format for the event is going to be uh, Professor Diamond will speak for about 40 minutes, after which uh, we will invite Professor Duster to come forward and offer about 10 minutes of remarks. And then we will open things up for Q&A. So first I'd like to introduce Professor Diamond. She is a professor at the Wright Institute here in Berkeley. She was also raised in Berkeley, so she's Berkeley roots. And her first studies were on suicide risk factors. Then she moved on to toxic exposures and its relationship to Parkinson Parkinsonism with a focus on those who made the new span of the San Francisco Bay Bridge. For this work, she received an award. Uh, she, along with the team that she worked with, received uh, were nominated for the Centers for Disease Control 2007 Prize in Excellence in Assessment and Epidemiology. Continuing her interest in toxins, she is the inventor of a solar panel water catchment device, which is co a very cost-effective way to sequester rainwater and also provide electricity to help the 30 million people in Bangladesh who are exposed to well water contaminated with arsenic. Amazing. Currently, she's working on understanding environmental factors in autism. I'd also like to introduce our respondent, Professor Troy Duster, who probably needs no introduction, but I will offer one anyway. He is Chancellor's Professor of Sociology he, here at UC Berkeley. He is also Emeritus Silver Professor of Sociology at NYU. He is the past president of the American Sociological Association. He served as chair of the National Advisory Committee on Ethical, Legal, and Social Issues in the hu Human Genome Project. Those are only a few of his major uh, leading uh, leadership accomplishments. He was also the founder of the Institute for the Study of Social Change, uh, which um, became ISSI. His books um, related to the Human Genome Project include uh, Backdoor to Eugenics and Cultural Perspectives on Biological Knowledge. He uh, has recent publications also relevant to this work pre being presented today, and they include Social Diversity in Humans, Implications and Hidden Consequences for Biological Research. Um, that was in Perspectives on Human Variation. Ancestry Testing and DNA, Uses, Limits, and Caveat Emptor. That was published in Genetics as Social Practice, Transdisciplinary Views on Science and Culture. And also the publication Emergence versus Reductionism in the Debate over the Role of Biology in Politics which was published in the journal Perspectives on Politics. So please join me in welcoming Professors Diamond and Duster. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, probably people came to the talk for a variety of reasons, and so what I'd like to do is um, talk about how the study got going, talk about autism, uh, talk about environmental toxins, a little bit about epigenetics, and then close it up and field any questions that you have about um, the work and the, and the next chapter of this work. All right, so some background factors leading up to this study. In the last decade, prevalence of several conditions have risen. Asthma, more than 10 million U.S. children have at some point been diagnosed with asthma. 
when I was a kid, asthma was fairly rare. And there are some places in the United States, uh, I think Modesto is one of those places, where more than a quarter of school-age kids have asthma now. In 2012, there was a CDC study, and they found that 17% of youths 12 to 17 years old were on some kind of regular medication for a health condition, compared to 14% of kids who are 5 to 11, and 7% of kids that were 4 and under. Uh, learning disabilities have risen. In 2012, 4.9 million children aged 3 through 17 had a learning disability. And um, I'm in education, and I see that learning disabilities is going up, and I try and plan my lectures so that um, people with different learning styles can get the most out of it. Um, some background factors leading up to the study um, continued. About 4.5 million U.S. kids under the age of 18, so 7%, receive special education or early intervention services. Um, and that number hovers, I read a more recent study, it sort of hovers in the same range. Boys, 10%, were twice as likely as girls, 5%, to receive those services. Attentional problems like ADD and ADHD have also risen. Bipolar disorder has increased by manyfold, and I tried to know by how much. But one of the problems is the definition of bipolar has sort of changed a little. So it's slightly difficult to track this, but it's by manyfold. And the incidence of autism has also risen. So the CDC estimates that one in 68 children, eight years old, now has autism. And this is different in different places, which is a big clue to me. Disorders of neurobehavioral uh, development affect 10 to 15 percent of all births in the United States. Health correlates with income, and when asked about their children's health uh, in the 2012 CDC study, uh, parents defined as poor. Poor parents reported excellent health in only 46 percent of their children, so le less than half. Uh, and this compares uh, with 64 percent of families who were not poor, who said, my kid is in excellent health. Many posit that these problems arise from environmental exposures. Um, some blame genetics. In fact, we now know that environmental factors can work through genetic mechanisms. For example, we can have genes which increase our risk for various ailments, but in combination with environmental factors, such as pollution, people and their offspring are at greater risk. So when I talk to my students about this, what I say is, we don't all know what our liability genes are, and sometimes those same genes could be protective for other things, but their liability genes, for instance, for whatever it is, breast cancer or something like that, and in combination with perhaps lifestyle, uh, living near um, pollutants, then we increase our risk for that. So they work together. Exposures may also cause epigenetic changes. So these are annotations to our DNA which affect gene expression. They may also cause de novo mutations, which may start in the egg or the sperm. So the DNA may remain the same, but how they speak and function can be changed. There'll be a little bit more on that later. Industrial chemicals. Uh, there, are about, there are thousands of chemicals, which include billions of pounds of neurotoxic pesticides, which now cover the globe. Pesticides are neurotoxins. They kill pests because they damage their central nervous system. We also have a nervous system. And so people like myself who are studying <coughs> neurodevelopmental problems look at pesticides. That's the first place to go because something that is tailor-made to damage the central nervous system of an insect may easily damage a, a young child's nervous system or a fetus's nervous system. Um, since Rachel Carson's day, we've realized that some of these chemicals are in every one of our bodies and in the sperm and ova, which will produce the next generation. So this is something else I always tell my students. Thinking about the world as a terrarium, there is no away when you throw something away. When we throw things away, um, it often leaches into the waterways or it's burned into the air and then we breathe it or it contaminates the soil. So in a recent case in Minneapolis, which happens to have a very high rate of autism, in the Somali community, it's about 1 in 38 children who live there, 
Uh, there's a lawsuit now against 3M because decades ago they made a chemical, it leached into the waterways, it will never come out of the waterways and people are drinking it and, and uh, are very worried about it. There are inequalities in exposures. Some inequalities can help folks like myself find more precise causes. So one time I was talking to Martine uh, in his backyard. We were talking about how I study things or how I like to study things. When I began studying welders, the people who made the new span of the Bay Bridge or other projects, what I wanted to understand was, okay, so you did this job with these exposures. Other people did other jobs almost the same but minus the welding. And you now have Parkinsonism and cognitive problems and impotence and sleep problems and other cognitive issues. So it helps people focus in on uh, what the causal mechanisms might be. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so the last slide was on inequalities of exposure. And uh, here's a waste site. I think this one is in Jakarta. Um, and I've seen a few uh, waste sites like this, and they're really amazing places. Um, the last photo is a child in Jakarta, and when I first saw a wayside, I was about 16 years old. Uh, I went to Tijuana twice, once when I was 14 and once when I was about 16. And um, I was there actually with a professor from, from Cal, uh, who was a journalist. And what we saw were children, parents, pregnant women looking for food and sorting through garbage, and every society has them, and it made a very, very large impact on me. Um, and people lived within the waste site. Their, their small home was attached to the waste site. Here's another waste site in a more middle class neighborhood. Uh, this is 20, 27,000 tons of industrial and household waste next door to a very middle class cul-de-sac in Bromley, UK. And um, these uh, waste company bought that property and put the waste there. And then these guys said, no, no, we can't open our windows. There's rats everywhere. Toxins are seeping into the waterways. You have to do something. And then a few years later, they moved it. Probably they moved it someplace where people wouldn't complain as much. Or they burned it and we breathed it in. Something like that. Children are at an increased risk of pollution-related diseases. Their lives begin when sperm and egg meet, you knew that, and both parents bring with them their own lifetime of exposures. New life is the process of laying down the template of the being, of our being. It's sculpted by cell division to create physiology, and that includes the mind, and that mind is supposed to serve us for the rest of our lives. It's possible that this very tightly choreographed step-by-step -step process, which begins with the wrong ingredients <coughs> of life at conception, is particularly susceptible to pollutants. So in health studies, sometimes I think about timing as being very important. That if we had the same exposure when we were 25 or 45, it would be different than if we had it uh, during gestation or when we were six months old or something like that. One line of thinking was that the placenta is a barrier to the fetus, getting toxins um, that the mother is exposed to and filtering them out. This is sort of how I learned it, that the placenta is a very wonderful organ that keeps the fetus from uh, being exposed to the toxins that the mother is exposed to. And now we know that actually that's not true. If you look at studies of mother's blood and certain kinds of toxin, the mother can have um, less in her blood and the fetus has more because it actually magnified it. It didn't filter it. <laughs> the Environmental Working Group has done two studies you might be interested in. One was in 2005 and one was in 2009 analyzing cord blood, the blood, uh, the cord blood connecting the mother and the fetus. And in both studies, all the babies came into the world what's called preloaded. So, um, and not just with one, but most of the babies came into the world preloaded with over 20 chemicals. And those are the links to the studies if you'd like to, to take a look. A few slides back, I mentioned epigenetics. Epigenetic annotations um, superimposed on our DNA can not only change the expression of genes, but can, though not always, be passed along for several generations. So when an environment, uh, environmental toxin, for instance, changes the reading of 
the genetic code. It's not that the one child has it, but that, that those changes actually can be passed along for a few generations afterwards. And toxins are among the stressors which cause epigenetic changes. So what does epigenetic change mean to us? I actually am still working on my exact feelings about this, um, besides just um, being very, very angry. So we live in a time of growing economic inequity, and the data from environmental health researchers would suggest there's health inequity. Um, and not just here, but around the world. And so what does it really mean to disadvantage a child through environmental pollution, because there's no more throwing something away, um, but rather disadvantaging a whole lineage? And uh, that has a different kind of meaning to me. And here we have to just think, every scholar to himself or herself, as a, someone you know, who works within law or health or medicine or sociology, what does that mean to disadvantage a lineage? So tying this back into the study of autism, the prevalence of autism began to rise, not just in the US, but in Iceland, Korea, and Japan, and the UK. And these are places we have research data for. I didn't mention other countries because sometimes we have no data on the prevalence there. So that's part of inequity. Earlier studies estimated the prevalence of autism, and this was under a slightly different definition, but about one to two to five in 10,000. And today's estimate is closer to two per 100. So some background on what autism is. I'm sure many of you uh, already know this, um, but autism is a spectrum disorder, so people can vary very widely on uh, what kind of autism struggles they have. Um, there's a saying, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Hmm. There's many, many kinds of autism. Um, importantly, there's 3.5 million people with autism living in the United States. Um, and some of the core features, uh, and not everybody has these, are deficits in social communication, social reciprocity, decreased nonverbal communication, and some people with autism are nonverbal. In the US, the CDC study found that among children identified with autism who had IQ scores available, about a third also had intellectual disability. Though many with intellectual disability or who are nonverbal um, may not have been tested. For many years when I was working in the Parkinson's project, I was a psychometrician doing IQ tests. So hundreds, maybe thousands of IQ tests. And some people are not testable because they, they don't speak. There can be repetitive behaviors and restricted interests and strong desire for sameness and a rigidity which can make the unexpected events of everyday uh, life more challenging to the individual or the family. So riding in a bus, or let's say the bus is delayed, or taking an airplane ride, or trying something new. Many can have very focused or unusual interests in something that often doesn't lead to a more social or academic range of opportunities. So people can have amazing levels of expertise, but sometimes these expertise don't open up into a broader world that allows them to discourse and become professionals in that topic area. There's also lots of comorbid conditions, and comorbid are the other clinical conditions that go together with autism. And these comorbid conditions are, the very common ones are stomach problems, gastrointestinal problems, specific learning disabilities, seizures, depression, OCD, attentional difficulties, disordered eating, self-injurious behavior, like head banging and biting, and an increased risk for suicide. In a study that was published, um, I didn't read the study, I only read the synopsis, um, by researchers at Yale that I saw yesterday, it said that when they asked college students who had autism about suicidality, 75% of them said that they had at some point in their life made an attempt on their life. They had done a suicidal behavior. Increase in autism has led to a shift in societal needs. And these differences make for um, very, very large-scale um, tensions and needs. For instance, in California, there's not enough special ed teachers now. 
And so uh, earlier in the summer, I read of a program where they wanted to get special needs teachers from the Philippines to come to the United States, to come to California in particular, to work in the Sacramento uh, school district. With 80% of adults with autism not um, having gainful employment, another societal issue is housing, employment, long-term care needs for a group of people that's in the millions. The other thing that I do, uh, a societal need, and you probably might be very acutely sensitive to this, is that police need to know about autism. Um, when we think about police shooting or hurting people, they have a deep need to understand why somebody may not answer to their name or look them in, their eye, in the eye or behave in a way that's unfamiliar. And, of course, the police also need to know that this um, group of people as a whole has a much higher incidence, not only of suicidal <coughs> behavior, but sexual assault and victimization from other people. Um, and there's an increased need for educators from preschool through university to understand which anti-bullying programs actually work and what can be done to increase inclusion and matriculation. If any of you are teachers, I would love your ideas on this. There's an increased need for the training of everyone involved in disaster preparedness, which I am, um, to think about how do you help people through a fire or an earthquake or a hazmat situation when the other person is nonverbal or has intellectual struggles. So right now, I'm trying to work together, putting together uh, emergency preparedness for schools and families uh, for disasters like the one we had in the summer when there are major, major fires. And for the clinical psychologists, we need tests uh, unlike the ones we have now where we can come to understand people's ideas and thoughts uh, when, when people might not be verbal. So getting back to my study, I'm, I'm going to start that part of this talk now. Um, we're just going to look at this graph, and this is a graphic of the rise in autism from the year 2000 when it was 1 in 66 to... Uh, 2010 when it became 1 in 68. So a little about the CDC's Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. There are selected states, currently 11 of them. Within each state, there are selected counties. Through medical and school records, the average prevalence of autism in those specially selected counties stands for the average of the state. Averaging the prevalence of these 11 states is the average for our whole country. I think you could s see that there might be some problems with that. <laughs> All right, so this is the graphic. These are the 11 selected states, and um, the average within the counties there stands for, uh, it's a big part of the data for how we think it's really 1 in 68. So um, I said earlier that People who do research like me are focused on differences because the difference is, a, is some kind of clue. And here, um, in four counties looked at in New Jersey, the prevalence estimated was uh, 1 in 41 children. So you can see that they have a small number of counties on the edge of, on the, um, on the edge of New Jersey that participated in the CDC um, project. And then we see Wisconsin, and those purple counties at the very bottom of the state, those participated in the CDC project, and they found that the prevalence was 1 in 92. And, um, and there's no western state. This bothers me. Using differences in prevalence is a clue that I care about. Um, and you can think about differences in occupation, differences in region. I look at different differences in medication use. I ask parents if they took certain medications when they were pregnant, um, things like that. Um, so that's how this study began. Now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the basic methods. Um, and this isn't the whole recipe, but it's just a partial taste of the recipe we used. We reached out to parents who had children with a confirmed diagnosis of autism born in the year 2000 or later because the government data that I wanted to use starts getting good around 2000. The breadth of our study encompassed several things. 
like the occupation of clean parents, uh, where parents lived the longest, the zip code of where they were living at the time they realized they had conceived a child, their health status, kinds of jobs they had, kinds of neurodevelopmental problems their child struggles with, the global assessment of their child's autism severity. And then, many people don't know what health mapping is, and I'm not a really great artist, but um, I went, this project is international, and there are a lot of parents, and so I thought, well, I have to tell them what mapping is. And so I did this watercolor, um, and I wanted to take away every city name and every street name, because I didn't want anyone to think, oh, she's talking about, have I ever lived in Hamburg, or Berkeley, or whatever. So there's an ocean, there's a river, there's some blocks, up there, there's a park, and I just wanted to give people the impression that this study is about the science of where, and so I'm going to be asking you many questions, one of which is the zip code where you learned you were going to be a parent. There are two arms to this study, and the second arm of this study um, had to do with a pesticide, <coughs> a group of pesticides <coughs> called neonicotinoids commonly used in garden <coughs> and flea and tick control products, uh, which has been implicated in the mass pollinator die-off around the world. And this photo was taken in Tilden Park, and I thought it was very cool that a bee and a butterfly were sharing the same flower. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I communicate with parents on Friday, I talk about friendship and kindness, and so I sent them this. That's the day for friendship, Friday. Then we translated our questionnaire into Spanish, um, I can tell you the reasons later, if you're interested, why we didn't do many other languages. We reached out through social networking, and parents shared information about our study with friends and family. Some people tweeted it, and schools posted our requests for participants to their parents. Organizations focused on health and environmental issues also shared our post. And then we were really excited that 5,401 families um, participated with full data sets and um, shared their <coughs> pregnancy and life stories with us to a very large degree. So the nature of science is, is comparative. From the Environmental Protection Agency studies, we know that on average, approximately 17% of the population lives within three miles of a toxic waste cleanup site Sometimes those are called Superfund sites, and that's when the government, um, the federal government, says, okay, there's a lot of toxins here, it's been going on for many years, and we're going to spend millions of dollars and remediate this problem. Approximately 18% of the U.S. population lives one mile from a toxic release inventory site, and those sites are a special kind of site. Those are active industry sites, like... Um, I believe Berkeley has one in, uh, in West Berkeley, a steel foundry. Um, so these are active industries that use one or more designated chemicals. And those chemicals, so they're using it or emitting it, and um, they're considered hazardous to health or the environment. So if you're using one of those under the TRI, Toxic Release Inventory Registry, you have to say what you're using. And um, it's very important that people do that. Question? Yeah. And how much do those two numbers overlap, the 17 and the 18? Are those different populations? Different. For the families in our study, at the time of conception, how near were they living to a toxic site? This is sort of the basics of what we wanted to know. Would it be approximately the national average? We began doing mapping, looking also at nearness to military sites. So I mentioned two kinds of sites. One is the federal cleanup site and then the toxic release industry site. And now I'm putting a third in there. We also looked at military sites. Um, because um, nationally, there are about 150 military sites with um, hazardous contamination, like Camp Lejeune, Camp Pendleton in California because they were involved in weapons making, they have burial pits for old weapons, they have uh, weapon storage, chemical storage, and um, they do practicing of, of warfare. We started in California um, because I was born here, <laughs> and also because uh, the West Coast was left out. Uh, we both looked at the state as a whole, 
and then we looked at metropolitan areas and I selected the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, and the San Diego metro area. We had 558 families participating from California and this is what we found. Overall, 30.6% conceived their child within one mile or less of a toxic site. For San Francisco Bay Area participants, 44.2 had conceived their child within one mile of a toxic site. In Los Angeles, 58.1% of parents had conceived their child within one mile of a toxic site with a median distance of 0.88 miles. So very close in. And this is nowhere close to 18% live one mile or something like that. These are much different numbers. In San Diego, 45.7% had conceived their child within one mile of a toxic site. The next slides will cover California as a whole, then the Bay Area and San Diego. So I'll walk you through what it is that you are seeing. Is this the thing that is? Yes. Yes. Okay. So to start off with, these big yellow things are large-scale toxic sites with large contamination areas, like mining sites in Nevada. So big, big areas. Then I, maybe to see it better, I'm going to show you this red triangle, these red triangles, these are all federally funded Superfund sites. Mm -hmm. These are uh, long-standing waste sites that finally um, are getting cleaned up. And then where you see a green triangle, these are national priority sites. They haven't reached the status of becoming a Superfund site, but they're contaminated sites, and maybe someday they'll become Superfund sites. And then I want to tell you that everybody who participated in our project became a blue star. I told the parents, when you participate, every child becomes this star. We're going to put down a marker. And many parents asked, what does that map look like? Well, it was quite surprising to me that when I first mapped it, I put down all the stars. And I saw an array of stars over California. But it looked suspiciously like another kind of map that I had seen of all the toxic sites and these closely overlap. So even when we go out way to the edge where there's not a lot of people living, and if we were to look uh, demographically, I don't know how many thousand people live right here or in some of the Sierra foothills, even those families, not in metropolitan areas, are very close in to toxins. So here's the San Francisco Bay Area. and. Earlier I spoke about toxins and inequality. Largely I think that this is true, and I showed you the young person in Jakarta on the waste site. But I want to s make the situation slightly more complex. You'll see that around the southern area of the bay, there's a ton of superfund sites. And you know why that is? That's because, what? I heard a noise. Mercury. Some of it's mercury. Some of it is back in the day before this job was exported to China, when we made computer circuit boards here, we used chemicals that uh, were actually probably for the foreseeable future contaminating this area. So this is actually a very well-to-do area of the country with an extraordinary number of toxins in it. Now, the bay itself is not a super fun site. It doesn't have any special designation. Um, but you're not supposed to be eating out of the bay. I think we know that. Um, when I was a kid, there was a pier, and people fished out of it, and there were signs in a few languages that said, don't eat out of the bay, or keep it very minimal. And the reason is because toxins last, many of them, a very, very long time. So in 1849, when gold mining started, people used mercury to separate gold from the aggregate stone. And the use of that mercury traveled in rivers and ended up in the bay, and it's going to be there for the rest of our lives and the lives of future generations. So that also has some toxins, though it doesn't have a triangle on it. Here's Los Angeles, and the blue star is the participant, and then the active industry is the little dot. And 
I was very curious about areas like this where there was some housing. If you look very closely at the map, you can see that there's some housing, and then there's these factories uh, around the edge. And very often you see one super fun site and ten factories. That's not uncommon. Um, of Los Angeles has that. So then we layered it with the military sites that I told you about, and um, I'll show you two. One is Camp Pendleton, uh, which is a super fun waste cleanup site, and people work at Camp Pendleton, and they live in the nearby areas. Uh, we have participants who uh, conceived their child at Camp Pendleton. And the second is the Marine Corps Air Station at Miramar. Here it is. So this is San Diego. In Camp Pendleton, a super fun site is that spot up there. And here is uh, the Marine Corps Air Force Base. And these are also military sites. In this portion of the study, we looked at three kinds of um, toxic sites, uh, active industries, toxic cleanup sites, and military sites. And are there other things we could have done? Absolutely. Um, there's air pollution, very, very high levels of air pollution in the valley. Our kids going to school at, uh, and supplemental clean air during their breaks sometimes. Um, there's tap water contamination and there's long-standing soil contamination in lots of places because we do agriculture. So we looked at three major factors primarily because I had nice EPA data on that and so that became first way that we could do that. But we could enrich this situation by layering with other kinds of toxic situations. But for this, we did so. After we looked at California, then we needed to look at places in the CDC's monitoring program. So those places, the 11 selected places. The next slide is New Jersey, the state with the highest estimated prevalence of 1 in 40. So the, the next slide is sort of the same layout as the other ones. Here it is. So this is New Jersey. And these red ones are the cleanup sites. These are the industry sites. Every blue dot is a participant. And um, here again, even when you go out to Sussex County, way out in the more rural areas, you see that participating parents live next to an emitting factory a lot of the time, and um, what I like to do is I like to just look at the stars once, take that map away, then I like to put in the tox map layer, take that away, and just look at those two, and then I superimpose them. For New Jersey, within the counties included in the CDC monitoring program, 64.9% of the 126 families have conceived their child within one mile on the toxic industry site with a median distance of 0.82. So the place with, in the CDC monitoring program with the highest prevalence, 64.9% of our participants have conceived their child within a mile of the industry. The county is not included in the CDC surveillance program. 47.6% of the participating families had and the median distance was one mile, 1.1 miles. So remember, uh, my comparison, the science is comparative, uh, my comparison is the national data. 18% of the U.S. population lives one mile from the toxic release in the toy site, but that doesn't seem true of our families who had a child with a confirmed diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental problem in the autism spectrum. So we had an idea that proximity matters a lot. So while the population of bees and pollinators have fluctuated in the past, in 2006, colony collapse disorder came to mean a very significant die-off event. This die-off was observed across several countries, some experiencing a loss of more than 50% of their bees. About 10 million hives were lost, and that translates to hundreds of millions of bees an integral part of agriculture. Many nuts, vegetables, fruits, and berries, about a third of our food supply, depend on bees for pollination. And without them, the cost of food rises, and the people who are hurt the most are the poorest. Neonics are one class of neurotoxins. So as I mentioned, 
These pesticides work because they damage the nervous system of insects. These came into use in the U.S. in the early 1990s and today are the most widely used pesticides in the whole world. They are implicated in the mass diet. And when you don't have these, you have to hand tolerate, and that's very expensive. And so this is a picture from China where somebody has a bent bamboo rod, and it looks like there's some feathers at the end, and you have to hand pollinate the trees. And there's something really close. Well, um, he knows how to plant trees. <laughs> We wonder whether close exposure to this neurotoxin might be related to autism. So we knew that close proximity probably was a big player. Then we looked at things that we are very close to. So interesting, very close exposures led us to neonics, which is sort of new on our chemical, uh, in our chemical lives. And they're used not just in agriculture, but they're used in house, in gardens, um, Households and on pets as long lasting free to control products. For many people who have a pet, you might have a bottle of something. So, what we told the parents do you use something that you, a liquid that you put on the spine of the upper neck here, on the back of the neck of your head or not? And so, those are the effects. And they work for a long time because they get into the animal and then um, for a while they don't have. So in the second arm of the study, we asked parents to tell us about their neonate exposure in five time windows. Three months before pregnancy, the three trimesters of pregnancy, and three months uh, after birth. Note that when we're mapping these exposures this time, it's not to geography, we're thinking about time. Because when you're thinking about chemicals and health, I'm thinking that geography is one major factor and time is another. Those two things are very important. So of those who could remember that period, um, we looked at the data. And the data looks like this. This is a very powerful graph to me. And along this right-hand side, we see you need a portrait for pet products, you need a portrait for house and garden, which we asked about. Dinotopuron is another chemical, Clopinamidin is for the garden, Acetamiprin is another, Theoclopin is another, and so on. And they ask people, look under your kitchen, go to the shed, what do you have? And we found the UK product names and the English names, and we got the best information we could. And, for, um, and we got this graph. And what it shows us is that a lot of people, preconception, had rather high exposures. This is what they said. Um, of all of them, not just the pet thing, but um, they were using many of these. And then as their pregnancy went, they used less and less, and then it jumped back up after they had their kid, and they thought, hey, we've got our TV, and we can start uh, tackling aphids again. Or something, I'm not sure. We know that neonics are neurotoxins, and do they hit us below the belt? I, I believe so. Uh, many studies have concentrated on in utero exposures to the fetus. Preconception exposure is important. We need to focus on sperm and egg. And many reproductive health studies focus on women, um, because women carry babies. Um, and I think there needs to be more on men's reproductive health, is what I came to think. We do know that men and women who make babies tend to share the same living space and exposure to the same furry animals. And um, we also know that autistic children have more de novo mutations than typically developing children, and that a majority of these are paternal origin. Why might sperm be very vulnerable? Spermatogenesis, I can't either think you are this. Spermatogenesis, the process by which sperm are made, it takes about seven weeks. It takes seven weeks to make sperm. Then sperm are stored for a short while. This takes place entirely within the short preconception window, that time before conception that we asked about. In the interest of compactness, so they need to 
be healthy and have genetic material, but they also, uh, in the interest of compactness, lack defensive quality control mechanisms that other cells have. So they are very, very vulnerable to environmental toxins. Ovogenesis, on the other hand, starts in fetal life about uh, a final maturation of the egg takes place within weeks of this. In this project, so now I'm segueing into something else. In this project, ToxMap was important. And I'd like to say a little about how ToxMap came about. The EPA came about in 1970, and ToxMap started in 1984. Um, and it's a mandatory reporting system for industries which use or emit one or more of several thousand chemicals. And largely, it came about because there were major, major disasters. Uh, one was the Bhopal uh, pesticide catastrophe, in which thousands and thousands of children died. And actually, we don't know how many thousands died because they were poor in that area. And some of them didn't have any papers uh, associated with them. So that there's an idea of um, parents saying, I lost a child, and then uh, legal mechanisms say, no, uh, we, don't, we don't know that you've actually lost your child. And um, the following year after Bhopal, uh, William Carlyle, the company involved in Bhopal, was also in West Virginia, and they had a uh, chemical spill. And then it came to, and then researchers found out that they had actually had 60 uh, chemical spills, and they had told people that. This is a, probably a parent or a relative in Bhopal, and these are the kids who passed away. Some of them. So how many chemicals are used in the U.S. industry, and what is our guess? What? Found. Thousands. It's thousands. It's thousands. Do we have any finer sense of that? There are 84,000. And they're very regulated, and laws which allow companies to evade disclosure do so by saying that these are trade secrets. So if you make a wonderful flea and tick product, or a pesticide, or uh, a new adhesive of some kind, or something like that, Sometimes you don't have to disclose because it's your trade secret and we, we want to facilitate businesses doing well. Um, most new industry uh, industrial chemicals get a pass because in our system they're presumed acceptable, or sort of presumed innocent, mm -hmm. until actual harm has been demonstrated. If there's 84,000, it's very hard to demonstrate harm um, because the context of pollutants is so large. So, with so many chemicals, it means that it can be difficult to meet the burden of proof, and this, this of course, uh, helps industry. Um, what if chemicals working synergistically cause more harm than alone? That's a possibility. But what if some people are more vulnerable than others, because we're all a little bit different? What if the timing of your exposure makes all the difference? Chemical harm on lens and societies will not. In closing, I want to say that the EPA is dramatically weakened now, and um, voice of science is sort of being muzzled. There are many good scientists at EPA that have left. Um, in the future, I'd like to focus on generational effects. Uh, looking, as I spoke to this gentleman before the talk, I'd like to look at grandparents and children and grandchildren and see how epigenetic changes um, manifests through generations. Um, if I can, I would like to help regions which don't have an estimate of the prevalence of neurodevelopmental disability in their community to start using cell phones and screeners and reach out to parents. Where there is no prevalence known, there are five things I'm very concerned about. One is there's no early treatment possible, and early treatment makes a very big difference. Two, there's no accountability. Three, no tracking and their prevalence has gone up or down. Four, no societal support for families in the hospital or in schools or job sites or in housing. And five, the proliferation of misinformation and stigma. Though I study the burden of toxins on the brain, I hope sociologists will study the ways in which autism and other neurodevelopmental struggles shape our communities 
And tomorrow is International Women's Day. And in closing, I would like to say that the history of the study of autism is the history of telling women that they weren't good enough parents. Mm -hmm. It's the history of saying, you had this kid because you were cold. And it's called the refrigerator mother. And many, many generations of people probably know this. One, you know, fairly decently. It started in the 50s and persisted for quite some time. Um, so maybe not many generations, a couple of generations know this. And it's hurtful and it's hard to outrun this. And so we know better now. And so research may not um, come by exact answers and full answers very easily, but it still has the ability, I think, to chip away at this kind of prejudice. So a while back, I was talking about what epigenetics is. That is, um, how genes are expressed and change depending on environmental toxins. And I asked you to think of a word or the words for this particular situation of disadvantaging people or disadvantaging a image. And I'd like to know what you thought. And um, if you want to email me just to say, I went to that talk. This is what I thought when I heard that. And I want to thank you for coming. century, it was the health professionals, the psychiatrists, the psychologists. They were the advocates for um, the mentally ill. Then she moves into the 20th century. She says, well, there was a shift, and there began to be an issue where the families of the mentally ill began to challenge, and sometimes take over from the health professionals, the psychiatrists, about advocacy for the health conditions of both the mentally ill. And finally, she arrives at the 1960s, and there is a movement to have the mentally ill speak for themselves. Now, part of the answer, part of the way in which this is framing for me, and I'm going to go to the parallel in a moment, um, Chandler talks about how um, there was a shift to spectrum disorder in mental health, mental illness. So at, at one point, we had this rather small group of people called schizophrenics. And then over time, that expands to a spectrum, schizophrenic spectrum disorder. What that does is to include many more people in the category. Um, but it does something else. It says, who's speaking in behalf of the mentally ill? And once you widen that spectrum, you move away from the most, quote, extreme forms of mental illness, and you move to people who are able to give language, to give texture and nuance to the experience. That's an extraordinary shift. Now here's the parallel. Um, autism. You mentioned that there'd been this great shift in the last part of the, well, the first part of this century, but certainly the last 20 years of the, uh, the last century. How extraordinary the shift had been, and that you showed that graphic way up. Well, let me take a page from uh, Chandler, which is part of that answer is the movement from autism as having a very narrow window, a narrow, narrow con conception of what is involved in autism, to Asperger's and spectrum disorder. And what that does is to say, well, who has autism? And it's not simply in 1950s terms of the, uh, you gave up the, gave the examples that small group, but they became a spectrum. And that spectrum widened the net and in part explains the explosion. Now, Ian Hacking, 
gave the Nelton Lecture at um, NYU about 12 years ago. It was a wonderful lecture on autism. Um, but he got into trouble at the very end, and it's part of what your conclusion was. Now, in his lecture, Hacking goes into the detail of the spectrum disorder. And he does talk about how, as I said, uh, as you move into a spectrum, you increase the number of people in the taxonomic system. Mm -hmm. right? That's clear. Um, but then he went further. He said, well, once that happened, who spoke for the autistic? Because, as you know, up until the period where the Asperger's comes into light, the autistic don't speak for themselves. He was caught, he said, in this contradiction. Who speaks for them? And then he made this move. He said, well, it turns out that if you look at the sample he was looking at, there was an increased representation of people from more privileged backgrounds. That the autistic movement of the late part of the 20th century, early, early 21st, was, was driven by professionals, lawyers, the psychiatrists, um, people who had access to resources. And autism <coughs> becomes much more a public issue because of who had it and who had the voice and the advocacy. Okay? So that part of Packing's lecture was OK. Um, he then began to hint at something you indicated that in your closing remarks. He said, well, it turns out that there were a lot more middle class people with offspring who were autistic than you would have expected from your account of environmental insult. He said that a lot of people who were now having autistic children and were the voice and advocacy for them uh, were coming from this more privileged sector. Sorry to get into some trouble here. And finally, he, he concludes. And he went into a long, detailed account, and he's a very sophisticated analyst. He talked about how professionals, um, it, was not, it wasn't so much the cold refrigerated mom, but it was in that direction. Uh, the professionals, as two parents, both working, both lawyers, both psychiatrists, and so on. And he then described in this last part of his talk the, the refrigerated problem, which enraged the audience. Uh, because at least half the audience at this particular Melton lecture um, were parents of autistic kids, and it was a conflagration. Okay, so I, I want to, um, I, I should probably just ask a few questions of you, so it's rhetorical, before I, before I turn it over, because we're only out of time. Okay, so I guess the first question would be, what, what's your response? to the uh, Hacking's view that spectrum disorder played a pretty significant role in the shift that you, uh, I saw on your, on your graphic as you moved from the 1980s to the 2000s, it was Zoom. So to what extent is, is the spectrum disorder an issue? That's the first question. Your paper strongly suggests, even maybe documents, environmental assaults that account for the sharp increase in cases of diagnosis. I'm reminded of what's happened with um, with diabetes in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And there's no doubt with that it's not just a matter of spectrum disorder. It's diabetes is diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so there's good evidence there. Um, now, but before we get to some of your work, of course, there was Bob Bullard, Stumpy and Dixie, and Julie Say's work, which talks a lot about toxic sites, toxic dumps, and its impact on health. Um, so we, and we know the poor are far more likely to be living around toxic dumps than our middle class or the we know that. So th this, is, this is the counterintuitive posing of, 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 a hackman, of a, a hacking's piece, namely, well, you know, if toxic waste dumps are explaining it, and all these people who were, not all, but many of them who are now expressing Asperger's and Peckham disorder are middle class, well, what's, what's the way in which one might come to a reconciliation with that? Um, so again, he went on, on this limb, uh, let, let the parents in the audience view me. And uh, I can tell from your closing remarks that you have little patience with the refrigerator clause. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I wonder if you'd respond, this per, per, especially to the spectrum disorder issue. Uh, what is the thing I can send people? Uh, okay. What is the thing I think I should be able to send people uh, to 
Empire uh, health statistician, um, even if you take into consideration the widening of the spectrum, which he said the spectrum is now wider and it includes college professors and all kinds of people, it's not the autism that we thought of back in the day, but in the 40s, 50s, uh, Anyway, um, even taking that into account, it seems to have risen. And I would be happy to pin out any papers that people are interested in because we looked closely at that. Um, you asked another question, or I think you touched upon something that's dear to me, which is who speaks for who? And in social justice research, I think a lot about this, um, which is that I want to be able to, this game doesn't get to your question, but it gets to the question of who speaks for who, which is very, very important. One is that I'm an outsider to this, and so I always have to say that I'm privileged to be led into a community. And I have to do my best to safeguard that data, to take care of it, and to always recognize that I have a fixed amount of information from every family that I'm working with, and that they actually hold bigger repositories of information, um, whole stories, whole novels, worse and lives that um, they are dealing with. And so part of social justice research has to include stepping back. And so I can do my part, and I can go up and uh, tell people what math is. But then there is some where I present uh, information. But then I also have to step back and parents and families and people who want to have to come forward to, to the best of their ability and skill and be encouraged to do so. That's only great. That's the way it is. And so part of the work is finding out as much as I can. Part of the work is stepping aside. Okay, yeah, so we have about 15 minutes, so um, let's get Thank you, thank you. Um, just a couple of uh, points. You described at the beginning the broad range of what is considered the autism. Is there any class difference within where the within that range of the irregularities on that. That's number one. Number two, in Europe, they have the whole harm reduction approach to public policy. I'm just wondering how, what are the differences even in the rates in terms of that and how that works in the um, middle class. And then two things, the middle class, the argument against uh, vaccinations and the protection between them. Uh, yeah, so starting with the last question, Certainly vaccinations can harm people who have no ability to mount a defense against the vaccine. So there's a small, small segment of people who probably shouldn't have these at all. But uh, the connection between vaccines and autism hasn't been able. The other thing about uh, your question of, uh, in Europe, I think some countries in Europe have seen stabilization of their rates. And they've also taken other measures like limiting population's exposure to neonics that we have. And your first question had to do with um, a different system that they have in the EU, which is in our system, it's um, innocent until proven guilty. And then they say, no, you have to show that this is healthy. And um, I think that that is uh, healthy. Just thinking from the perspective of let's not think about only autism, but let's think about all kinds of things. Um, like cancers and whatnot. It is the better system. It is the way better system. But moving uh, our system to that system seems to be uh, not possible for them. Charles, you're next. Oh. Okay. Uh, I have Frank next, then Deborah, then Mary. Okay, so I'm at the risk of being too negative. negative. This is. Your, your analysis borders sort of on the edge of science and close to pseudoscience. It's, it's not very satisfying, and it's potentially uh, inflammatory. So, so for instance, you have the neonics, and you find neonics in people's houses, but you have no dose response or any clear indication that everybody else in the world doesn't have three times as much. Or you make a snowball sample of folks 
with autism spectrum, it seems. That's how you, you found people through linkages to other people. And they may all live in the same area, which might be near sites. There's no, I mean, there has to be some science here about what the exposure to the different sites are. Yeah, yeah, but the way in which you gather them might mean that they're associated within geographic areas. We did have to tell people at the front, this is bad friend. And we're looking at all the things that are most effective. So we didn't say, we're looking at my friends, we're looking at the people who are living in the environment, we're looking at us, we're looking at the soil, we're looking at the countries, and everything. And if I start with a thousand possible exposure reports, even a four thousand possible exposures to students, there are going to be Absolutely. hundreds, if not thousands, which are associated. And you have to do something different, which is yes. to find some better science. Yes, to show the association. People recognize this, and I can ask for, hey, where's your comparisons? Look. Now, in a situation where everybody has higher exposures, it's really hard. There's tons and tons of pioneers. And so we have to find a group of people um, who for sure has no neurodevelopmental disability as my comparison, perhaps. Or I have to strategize that way. But I think this at first pass, this is actually quite good. Uh, when I worked on the uh, Parkinson question, um, people had suspected manganese poisoning led to Parkinson's. Um, by looking at manganese miners in the Greek, uh, South America, starting in the 1930s, until uh, fairly recent, in 2006, 2007, that it was like, okay, yes, I, I think well maintained exposure in manganese might be real contributors to this movement as well. So I'm willing to put in a lot of time to this. I, didn't, I don't feel like this first pass is enough. I myself feel Thank you, Deborah. Well, I was going to say something. Say more, but a little bit nicer. Uh, <laughs> well, since can we move on? No, we're well. I, 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 okay, just really briefly. So I think that I think that you need to think a little bit more about the selection because part of your um, recruitment was through environmental organizations, and so people who are going to get the word from environmental organizations are people who are already concerned about environmental factors, and maybe that's more likely to live in your facility. So, you know, if you could get access to some, you know, populations of people with autism, perhaps they're working with the CDC, then you could, you know, do a better comparison. And just a small, small thing is that you said that the nationwide rate was 17%, or 18%. And then you are comparing that to the rate in the population. But it would be more accurate to not use the nationwide rate, but to use the rate, say, all of the rate in all of California is whatever, probably higher than 17. We and don't always have that information. We just use the comparisons we have. OK. But I, just, I think that you could moderate your claims a little bit. You know, I, think that, I think that's maybe what Frank was responding to. I think that you. If you have such a strong, the some of the things you have are so strong, and yet I think there's a a little bit of overreach that may be a little. Bit. Yeah, I don't think that there's too much overreach because I didn't actually lay any claims that any specific chemical caused this, and I didn't say this is the exact bullet that caused this problem. Never did I say that actually. So this is the association of proximity that we found in our data. Larry. Here's the thing that you're going through my mind, and, and I, I, I would like to congratulate you on this. And there was a question of time, and, and, and that, that, you know, in, in, one would think that you know, if you were to put it in proximity for a long period of time, your likelihood of uh, Genetic problems would be higher, uh, and, and you know, right. and, and, and uh, you know, it's toward the end you talked about, you know, the seven weeks of, of, of producing okay. sperm, as though, it, which seems to suggest that you know, in seven weeks' time, that, that you could you could run into these problems. So, do you have any, and have you looked at the exposure time? Yes. Uh, in the recipe for our methods, one of the things we asked is, where did you live the longest? We actually haven't looked at that data yet. So there's people who are probably, one thing that we could do is, where did you live the longest? And can I make a matrix or a way of thinking about longest or better yet, risk of consumption? 
samples of these big areas and go in and see what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. That's where you see the devastation. And even in, in the spectrum, hours can go by every week, the discussion. But when you get down to the young ones, where they're really in bad shape, it's absolutely incredible. The people don't know anything about this. The social science don't study it. And first of all, you can't get funding for studying it. Right? And so it's really a, a very sad situation in this whole country. We're all looking for the big picture, because it sounds good, right? but it's really misleading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, okay. wow. I have two quick questions. One is, I'm curious if you know anything about how the CDC has selected which states and which counties to use. I'm not entirely sure. What I read about it, it seemed to me that they thought that this represented a huge portion a representative sample, and I was, uh, I would be looking up to the International Society of Autism Research in Guadalajara, and I think I did that <laughs> over there. I would really think that this is um, representative. Not entirely sure that it is. That's mm -hmm. one interesting finding. Is it, you know what it is? It? They seem pretty sure because it's a conglomeration of hundreds of thousands of data pieces from school and medical school. Really surprising though, I hear those statistics and I always assume they're looking at the whole country. Yeah. My other question is just like, you gave a lot of context about autism, and I knew a lot about autism maybe like 14 years ago, and it seems like the ideas about what are the causes of autism maybe have not advanced a lot. So I'm just wondering like, right, this is a first pass, and it seems like people haven't really done this before, or there's not actually, like just confirming, has there not been a lot of look at environmental um, I think there's been a lot of looking at, for instance, Farmworkers and Salinas, some very, mm -hmm. very fantastic studies mm -hmm. have looked at timing of pesticide exposure and crop testing, pregnant women and um, neurobehavioral uh, strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So like really specific for work. Very specific to the place. So this is um, really, I think, more of a comment. In, um, I think that this was, I really appreciated um, your presentation. And it, it's a comment in relation to some of the other comments that were made earlier and saying that, you know, this obviously is an area that there's not a tremendous amount of work in. And often we see that our first pass at those kinds of studies are these kind of large scale correlational kinds of analyses. And I think it's very novel mm -hmm. that you use mapping kinds of methodologies to kind of look and overlay what some of the different correlates of this outcome might be. I also think when we think about, you know, any study could be um, subject to, to various kinds of bias, and there could be selection bias in this study, who knows, but I, <coughs> I do think that when we think about what the exposure of interest is here, which is proximity to the Superfund sites, that, you know, there's something to be said for what the counterfactual is, right? The counterfactual here is proximity. So there was still heterogeneity in the exposure of interest, and I actually don't think you need a comparison group, because I think you already have a comparison group within the context of the question that you were asking. And I think a lot of times we go to you know NIH or whatever these funding sites are, so I do work on race. They always want to know, where's your white comparison group? Where there's enough heterogeneity within African Americans for me to ask the question that I'm asking, because my exposure of interest is racial discrimination, for example. So in the context of this study, in terms of what the exposure of interest was, proximity from a Superfund site. I actually think that um, these kinds of studies are great for showing those kind of broad correlations and then can really lend themselves to informing kind of future <coughs> research questions. Where do we go from here? Generating new hypotheses. So I, I actually um, really enjoyed this and am interested to see where um, this work is going to go next. And I did email you with my answer to your fill in the blank. What was it? <laughs> Tell us. Genocide. <laughs> Thank you, Amani. Any, any other questions? Yes. Uh, 
Sure. I'm Vince Sutter from, from Google, and I've been lecturing at the hall over there, and I was just warned uh -huh. in because I didn't have anything to do. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hey, glad you're to, welcome. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be helpful. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them has to do with the difference between correlation and causality. And I feel a lot more comfortable in this presentation if we had a better understanding of what it is that produces autism. I mean, it's clear that there's brain function which is not functioning properly. It could be brain chemical issues. You hint at things like epigenetics, but there isn't any collective connection yet between the condition that is exhibited as autism spectrum and all of the outside influences that you mentioned. So do we know anything right now about brain chemistry and brain anatomy uh, in people who exhibit autism or autism spectrum? and the associated concerns that you raise. And I'm still looking for the linkage as opposed to correlation. Thank you. Great. And I think I'm sort of looking for uh, what you're looking for, too. Um, there are some very good researchers who have looked at the kinds of maps that I used, um, TOTSMAP, for instance, and looked at neurodevelopmental problems and zeroed in on the kinds of emissions that those specific factories uh, have. So were they, did they use metals? Did they use any plastics? Did they use PFOAs? Things like that. So that's one kind of work. The other kind of work is um, on autopsy. Are the brains any different? And there has been studies on that. Um, so cell migration, when you are a fetus, your neurons go out to where they're going to live for the rest of their life. So maybe the neuron has a bit of a different life to it. And when you are forming, it goes out, and some of them will go here, and some will go there, and some will be on the exterior, some will be on the interior. There is some evidence that that migratory uh, dance is, uh, there's a problem there. Um, and that work was done by a doctor named Manuel Casanova, a very wonderful person who called a lot. So there are um, anatomical differences. And also in the serotonergic system, serotonin is in the pregnancy so field, uh, among many, many things for the okay and all the work. The high suicide uh, thinking, suicide thinking may be because of serotonergic problems, and it also tied to GI problems. So there is that kind of work, but uh, I'm not yet to the point where I was like, you know what causes this? Let me tell you. It's this, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody is there yet. And um, so we just stay humble and we just keep our nose to the ground. So, yeah. uh, with that, we're out of time. Um, so I want to thank everyone for a lively discussion.